Okay, now we're going to move on to talking about the chemical control of brain and behavior, which is just another way of thinking about how neurons in the brain communicate with each other and with the body. So up until now, we've been talking about what are called point-to-point -point communication systems. So that's pretty much whenever you have one neuron that communicates directly through uh, regular chemical synapses with a uh, distinct subset of neurons uh, and that forms a particular circuit or network that uh, is involved in some function. So all the sensory systems and motor systems we talked about up until now um, work through this kind of direct point-to-point -point communication system. So that could be, um, you know, you could be talking about, let's say, a, uh, a, a sensory neuron somewhere in the body. Um, and so um, again this is this is what we've been talking about when we talk about the the visual system for example so this could be you could be talking about a retinal ganglion cell here and neurons in the lateral geniculate nucleus here so we have a direct connection from one structure to another or this could refer to the the motor system so you could be talking about a neuron in motor cortex here and then say motor neurons in the spinal cord uh, down here so uh, that's what uh, that's what we've been when been talking about up until now. Um, but there are other ways that the nervous system communicates that are uh, not quite so uh, simple. So, uh, for example, we'll be talking about the secretory hypothalamus. So the secretory hypothalamus, uh, the hypothalamus, of course, is part of the brain, which we'll talk about. Um, and it has neurons in it, but those neurons, instead of communicating in a point-to-point -point way with other neurons through synapses, they essentially release their neurotransmitters into the bloodstream. So that means they secrete their neurotransmitters. That's what secretory means. And so they communicate with neurons or other cells that may be in the other parts of the body, um, and uh, then those neurotransmitters uh, travel a long distance to get to their targets as opposed to just jumping across a little synaptic cleft. Um, and so this is a way for the brain to communicate with a large uh, number of neurons distributed all over the body um, in a somewhat slower but still uh, widespread um, way. And so we'll talk about how that works. Um, and then there's another system called the autonomic nervous system, which we'll talk about. Um, and the autonomic nervous system works pretty much like the, the various point-to-point -point communication systems, um, except that you have uh, you know, a small number of neurons in usually the central nervous system that then communicates with a distributed network of neurons in, in the peripheral nervous system that then sort of uh, exhibit this sort of reciprocal um, uh, connectivity where activating one neuron activates uh, a whole network of cells that are all connected to each other uh, and then that has some sort of uh, very rapid downstream effect um, that may be uh, uh, again uh, distributed over a wide uh, number of tissues uh, very, and elsewhere in the body and then inside the brain these are the secretory hypothalamus and the autonomic nervous system as we'll see uh, involve communicating with neurons or tissues in the peripheral nervous system Whereas the diffuse modulatory systems, which we'll talk about, uh, involve uh, systems within the brain. So you have, you'll have neurons in the brain that have uh, axons that branch extensively. So in other words, rather than just uh, communicating with <clears throat> one or two or a handful of postsynaptic cells, neurons in these diffuse modulatory systems have branches that go all over the brain, usually to multiple um, different regions and they have synapse with a whole bunch of cells in those regions sometimes um, these sort of diffuse uh, what are called en passant uh, uh, synapses where rather than forming a discrete synapse with just one cell they just sort of release their neurotransmitter uh, into the the extracellular fluid and it just diffuses throughout a, a region of the brain um, just just activating neurons as it goes. In other words, there's uh, not uh, the, the the connections are much less discrete in these systems. So we'll talk about those. Um, so we'll start with the secretory hypothalamus. Um, so the hypothalamus, remember, is this structure um, right here in the ventral part of the diencephalon. So remember uh, this whole thing here uh, in 
the brain, the adult brain is the diencephalon. The dorsal side of the diencephalon, remember, forms the thalamus. And so the ventral side we call the hypothalamus because hypo means below. And uh, the, the defining feature of the diencephalon, the, the ventricular structure anyway, is the third ventricle. So the thalamus and the hypothalamus basically sit on either side of the third ventricle. And the hypothalamus uh, wraps underneath it. So the hypothalamus forms essentially the floor of the third ventricle. The other way to find the hypothalamus is to look for the optic chiasm. So this is the optic chiasm uh, right here. And, and so the optic chiasm sits uh, just anterior to the hypothalamus. Remember that this is where the two optic nerves uh, meet in, in before they become the optic tracts. Uh, and then the other thing to look for is the pituitary glands. The pituitary gland is, uh, and we'll talk about what it does in a second, uh, but it kind of hangs down from the ventral surface of the hypothalamus. So, um, you know, if you're looking for the hypothalamus from the outside, that's what you would you would look for. Uh, and then the job of the hypothalamus, among other things, is to to control what's called homeostasis. So homeostasis is basically controlling uh, or keeping certain parameters um, uh, that the body needs to to maintain survival within uh, sort of healthy levels. So this includes things like temperature, uh, blood pressure, blood volume, uh, salt concentration in the blood, pH of the blood, uh, oxygen concentrations, energy levels, and so on. So these are all values that uh, need to be uh, kept within a certain range. So uh, too high or too low, and uh, cells start to die, tissues start to break down, um, and so all of these need to maintain need to be maintained in order for uh, the body to survive. And so the hy hypothalamus both detects these things uh, in the body and helps to uh, control either directly or indirectly um, the the other tissues that can can modify them so temperature for example uh, the hypothalamus actually has temperature sensitive neurons in it these are similar to the temperature sensitive neurons in the somatosensory system uh, but of course those neurons detect mainly skin temperature. Uh, these neurons in the hypothalamus are really detecting your core body temperature because they detect the uh, essentially the temperature of your blood. Um, and same way with blood pressure. So there are pressure sensors, basically mechanoreceptors, in certain blood vessels in the, in the body. And the hypothalamus communicates with those. Um, and uh, blood volume and, and salt concentration are, are detected in part by the hypothalamus and also by the kidneys. Um, and then uh, things like uh, pH and oxygen, those can be detected by chemoreceptors uh, that are communicating with the hypothalamus. Same way with uh, detecting energy levels. So, so energy comes from the food we eat, mostly in the form of glucose molecules and fat molecules. And uh, the, the hypothalamus can <clears throat> both directly and indirectly measure the, the concentration of those, those substances in your body. And if any of those values gets too high or too low, they can be regulated. So if the body temperature, for example, becomes too high, uh, the hypothalamus can trigger a number of mechanisms that uh, can help increase body, I mean, decrease body temperature um, and vice versa. Uh, so, so that's kind of, uh, in a nutshell, the, the things that the hypothalamus is involved in. Um, usually you're not consciously aware of the, the, the things the hypothalamus is doing um, you know, if your if your skin temperature is too high or too low, you detect that through the somatosensory system. But if your body temperature, core body temperature, becomes too high or too low, you don't necessarily feel that uh, consciously, uh, uh, and your your response to that is usually not a conscious uh, uh, activity. So, for example, one of the things that the uh, hypothalamus can can control uh, is your uh, is shivering so the response to lower body temperature would be shivering and that that shivering uh, gets parts of your body moving generating more heat and that's uh, supposedly the uh, the purpose of shivering that's triggered by the hypothalamus and the the drop in body temperature that leads to it is detected by the hypothalamus uh, again though you're not necessarily you may feel cold um, but that that uh, response is not something you have control over uh, same goes for, say, oxygen levels. So uh, you can't really consciously be aware of the oxygen concentration in your body, 
but the hypothalamus does detect it. And if, say, your oxygen levels become too low, then the hypothalamus can trigger uh, increased respiration, for example. Um, and so you would experience that as, say, uh, hyperventilation, um, you know, breathing more deeply or more, more rapidly. And uh, that's, again, triggered by the hypothalamus by your brain, but not a part of your brain that you have conscious access to. So, um, so we're still talking about you know, sensory systems, motor systems, but these are not the same sensory systems that we've talked about up until now. They're, they're more uh, subconscious uh, sensory systems. Um, but still, still just taking in information mostly from, the in, from inside the body rather than outside the body and reacting to it through some sort of motor system, except not acting through the skeletal motor, motor system usually, um, but usually through uh, various smooth muscle systems that we'll, we'll talk about later. Um, so this is just the hypothalamus in a little more detail. Uh, again, it kind of forms the floor of the third ventricle. This is a cross section, a coronal cross section, of course. And so here you can see uh, the third ventricle. Um, the so the, both the walls and the floor of the third ventricle um, are formed by the hypothalamus. So it's not a very big structure. You have uh, just three zones, uh, three very uh, uh, narrow layers of cells that kind of wrap around the third ventricle um, the and they're just called the lateral uh, hypothalamus which is the uh, the furthest out to the side the medial hypothalamus is the middle layer and then the innermost layer we call the periventricular layer which is the layer that it's called periventricular because it is right next to the third ventricle it wraps around the third ventricle um, and then above that you have the thalamus and then the lateral ventricles you can kind of see up here actually they're um, these are the lateral ventricles up here so so these are the lateral ventricles again and they and those kind of feed into the the CSF into the third ventricle so there's the third ventricle um, and again, so this is not a big structure but it has uh, a big uh, impact on the body um, you can also see in here these white matter structures, these are the uh, optic tracts. So again, that's kind of another landmark to uh, identify the, uh, the hypothalamus. Now the periventricular zone is kind of the important part, at least for us. So um, we'll, we'll, the, the periventricular zone is the part of the hypothalamus that um, controls the autonomic nervous system, as we'll, we'll talk about in a second. And it contains the neurosecretory cells. So these are the cells that uh, control or release hormones into the pituitary gland. Um, so the pituitary gland is the gland uh, that the hypothalamus uses to send out hormones to the rest of the body. So the, uh, we talk about the secretory hypothalamus. That's what we mean. These, these cells in the periventricular zone that secrete uh, hormones into the pituitary. Um, first, uh, just one note about the word hormone. The word hormone is just a chemical that uh, one cell or one tissue in the body uses to communicate with some other part of the body. So a neurotransmitter is kind of like a hormone, except that usually neurotransmitters are just released across a synaptic cleft. So in other words, uh, they communicate uh, to a different part of the body, but that other part of the body is not very far away. Uh, whereas when we talk about hormones more broadly, we usually mean uh, chemicals that are released into the blood um, or perhaps into some other um, uh, bodily fluid, and then they communicate with cells that may be um, a considerable distance away. So, so uh, in fact, some of the chemicals that are uh, that we're going to talk about are very similar to the standard neurotransmitters we've we've already discussed. Uh, the only real difference is just how far they move before they communicate with their targets. So, uh, and so a gland is any structure that's whose main job is to release hormones into the bloodstream or to some other bodily fluid to communicate with some other part of the body um, that may be uh, downstream from it. So the pituitary gland uh, again hangs down from. The, uh, the ventral surface of the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is connected to the pituitary by this stalk here called the hypophysiotropic stalk. So this is the hypophysiotropic stalk. And uh, again, the, the pituitary kind of hangs down from 
the hypothalamus. Uh, it kind of sits inside a little piece of bone at the base of the skull, um, and it has two parts, the anterior lobe and the posterior lobe. So the anterior lobe is anterior in the front, and the posterior lobe is in the back, uh, in the posterior part, uh, as the name implies. And, uh, in fact, these two divisions of the pituitary are very different from each other, so much so, 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 much so that you can, uh, in fact, think of the pituitary as really two separate glands. Um, and uh, they have really two, two different functions, but uh, they both are under the control of cells in the periventricular zone called neurosecretory cells. Uh, the cells that interact with the posterior pituitary are called the magnocellular neurosecretory cells. So these are the magnocellular neurosecretory cells here. And they have axons that come down the hypophysiotropic stalk. So these are the axons coming down. And they synapse, essentially, with blood vessels uh, in the posterior lobe of the pituitary. So the blood vessels that enter the posterior lobe uh, come in and they form this, this capillary bed. So the blood kind of goes into all these little capillaries and then it comes back out um, uh, again. And uh, when these neurons, these magnocellular neurosecretory cells are active, they secrete their, their hormone hormones into the blood and then those uh, hormones leave through the uh, this blood vessel and then go out to the body and the posterior pituitary is actually pretty simple because there are only really two main hormones that are released from those magnocellular uh, neurosecretory cells one's called oxytocin um, so oxytocin um, is kind of complicated it actually does a lot of different things um, oxytocin is released from the hypothalamus during childbirth uh, in females. In uh, it's released during lactation. Also, um, it also has a role in uh, sex and pair bonding uh, in mammals. Um, and uh, it also seems to be sometimes it's called the trust hormone or the love hormone. Um, those are not necessarily scientific terms. Those are uh, uh, terms that are applied to it kind of uh, in the popular press. But um, there are some interesting stories about oxytocin. Uh, one comes from these little critters over here called voles. So voles are these little rodent-like animals. And there are at least two subspecies of vole. Uh, the prairie voles over here and the montane voles over here and they're very similar to each other anatomically uh, the major difference between the two is that uh, prairie vole uh, parents uh, tend to form pair bonds uh, both the male and female uh, help care for young and they tend to stay together for a long period of time even after mating um, montane voles on the other hand are much less social um, uh, Male and female breeding pairs do not stay together. Males do not have any role at all in caring for the young. Uh, the, the mother uh, cares for young. And uh, again, anatomically they're very similar. Um, genetically they're very similar. And so one thing that makes them different is that if you look for the oxytocin receptor, so this is the receptor that the, the oxytocin uh, molecule binds to. By the way, oxytocin is a neuropeptide, so uh, it's, it's uh, released uh, it's actually a short uh, uh, protein, but when it's released, it binds to receptors in various places in the body, but also in the brain itself. So there are oxytocin receptors in the brain. So, so when these hormones are released into the posterior pituitary and then into the capillary bed, some of these blood vessels eventually make their way back to the brain, and then they bind to uh, oxytocin receptors in the brain itself. So this is uh, these are cross sections of the brain in a prairie vole and a montane vole and uh, these dark areas are regions that have high levels of oxytocin receptor. Um, now in, in here you're seeing they're pointing to the nucleus accumbens. This is um, this is a part of the brain that's involved in reward. We'll actually talk about it more later. Um, but there's other parts of the brain that, that show different levels of, of receptor. But what's important is the difference in expression levels between the prairie voles and the montane voles. Uh, there's the, the uh, receptor levels are much higher in the prairie vole. That's why uh, these areas look much darker 
um, in the um, oops in the prairie voles versus the montane uh, vole brains um, and so uh, uh, but not only that uh, when you take uh, let's say montane voles and increase the concentration of oxytocin uh, in their in their blood or increase the expression of oxytocin receptors in their brain they actually start to behave more like prairie voles that means that males uh, tend to uh, care more for the young, they tend to form more long-term pair bonds, and vice versa. So in prairie voles, if you block the oxytocin receptor uh, or reduce oxytocin levels in their uh, in their brain, they behave more like montane voles. So they uh, have less pair bonding and less uh, 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 child care uh, of, of uh, males. So again, that seems to be um, at least one of the things that oxytocin is involved in. And then the other hormone that's released from these uh, from the hypothalamic magnet cellular neurosecretory cells uh, a separate population of cells under different circumstances um, is a hormone called antidiuretic hormone or ADH um, sometimes also called vasopressin so uh, vasopressin ADH are the same thing uh, again this is another neuropeptide so this is a short protein that gets released from these cells um, and uh, ADH works uh, on the kidney, so there are there are receptors for this hormone in the kidney, and the effect of uh, of the hormone is to regulate blood volume and blood pressure, and then salt concentration. Because uh, when ADH gets to the kidney, uh, kidney cells in response release a different hormone called renin. Renin. Uh, works on an, another hormone, so that you kind of have a cascading effect here. Renin uh, axon is an enzyme that breaks down a different hormone from the liver called angiotensin. Uh, angiotensin, uh, renin converts angiotensin into angio, angiotensin 1. I'm sorry, uh, angiotensinogen is released from the liver. Renin turns that into angiotensin 1, and then angiotensin 2 is derived from that. Uh, and the effect of that is to uh, basically increase blood pressure. So, in fact, the word angiotensin, angio means having to do with the, the circulatory system, and tensin means pressure. So it has the effect of increasing blood pressure by constricting the blood vessels and increasing blood volume by actually sort of inhibiting the kidney, so reducing the amount of water that the kidney removes from the, uh, the blood. So it sort of helps uh, retain fluid. If you have lower blood pressure, uh, and that, and the other thing is that uh, renin is also released by the kidney in response to lower blood pressure. So if your blood pressure gets lower, the kidney responds by releasing renin, which in turn uh, has the effect of raising blood pressure and reducing kidney activity, so that you you uh, don't uh, you don't lose water while your blood pressure is low, because uh, if your if your blood pressure is low and you're producing uh, a lot of urine that means you're losing water and you're further lowering blood pressure um, same thing uh, kidney also can detect uh, salt concentration so if if the salt concentration in the blood gets too high um, then you actually want to uh, or too low uh, then that means you actually want to to uh, produce less urine because you you don't want to um, uh, lose too much of that salt. So uh, that's the other, other thing that this system uh, regulates. In fact, that's why it's called antidiuretic hormone. Uh, antidiuretic, uh, diuretic is something that, that causes the body to produce urine uh, and to urinate. So uh, anything that is antidiuretic is something that inhibits urination. Um, another thing uh, to point out here is that this hormone, like a lot of these hormones, actually uh, works in kind of a feedback loop. So the angiotensin II actually uh, has the effect of uh, uh, activating a different part of the brain called the subfornical organ, which in turn activates the hypothalamus. So the, the, uh, that's kind of how the kidney communicates with the brain. So the kidney, uh, when blood pressure is lowered, uh, releases renin. Renin through this pathway um, eventually uh, triggers the release of ADH, so it kind of creates this feedback loop, um, and and that's uh, uh, an important point about the hypothalamus is that um, unlike the sensory systems where you can have a direct sort of point to point communication system, um, the the way that the hypothalamus gets its input from the body is kind of indirect or kind of roundabout through these uh, various hormone pathways.
Uh, and so again, the posterior pituitary only really releases uh, two peptide hormones, oxytocin and antidiuretic hormone, and they come from these neurosecretory cells. So the, the cells release those hormones directly into the bloodstream. Um, and so there aren't actually any any hormone releasing cells. There are no endocrine cells in the posterior pituitary. It mainly just consists of these blood vessels and then the, uh, the, the axons from these magnus cellular cells. Meanwhile, the anterior pituitary uh, gets its input from a separate part, a separate population of cells in the hypothalamus called the parvocellular neurosecretory cells. Um, now, you may remember that the words parvo and magno just mean small and big, and that's uh, true here too. So the, the magnocellular cells are just bigger than the parvocellular cells. So that's where they get their name. But the other difference is that the parvocellular neurosecretory cells have axons that go down into this hypophysiotropic stalk, but instead of going all the way into the pituitary, they stop and form synapses with blood vessels in the stalk itself. In fact, uh, the hormones they release we call hypophysiotropic uh, hormones. And then those uh, hormones are released into the bloodstream into uh, uh, the bloodstream kind of goes this way. It comes in through the hypophysiotropic stalk and then goes down into the anterior pituitary. So we've got hormones coming down into the anterior pituitary. Uh, and then once they get there, they stimulate, uh, or in some cases inhibit, depending on the, the hormone, uh, cells in the anterior pituitary, which are the actual hormone secreting cells. So all these cells, not all of them, uh, it depends on which uh, hormone is released, uh, are stimulated or activated by these neuron uh, cells uh, in the parvocellular part of the hypothalamus. Um, but again, the, in this case, the hormone has to travel uh, not a long distance, just, just down the stalk, fr from the stalk to the anterior pituitary. And then those cells release a different set of hormones that then go out into the sort of systemic, um, um, in other words, the bodily circulatory system, where they have their effects somewhere else in the body. And, and which part of the body depends on which hormone um, is being released. And uh, another difference between the anterior pituitary and the posterior pituitary is that there are more hormones. So uh, the posterior pituitary, again, only releases two hormones. The anterior pituitary releases uh, at least six. So um, uh, these are the six hormones that are released from the anterior pituitary. Again, these are the ones that come from these cells here, the, the anterior pituitary uh, neurons. Um, and they go out into the body and each one has a different target somewhere in the body uh, and has a different effect. Um, these two, the uh, follicle stimulating hormone and uh, luteinizing hormone, both work on the gonads. So the gonads are the reproductive uh, organs of the body. So for males, that means the testes. For females, that means the ovaries. And uh, they have different effects depending on which kind of gonads they encounter. So in females, uh, FSH, follicle stimulating hormone, triggers ovulation, which means the, uh, the production of eggs. Whereas in uh, testes, the uh, FSH triggers spermatogenesis, which means the production of sperm. Whereas luteinizing hormone, uh, is important for uh, maturation or development of egg and sperm. So again, in, in females, uh, the ovaries uh, response to LH is to help the egg go through its maturation process. And in males, uh, LH triggers maturation of sperm in the testes. Um, so these are, of course, both important for um, the reproductive cycle um, for, uh, for animals. Uh, TSH, or thyroid stimulating hormone, um, as the name implies, uh, works on the thyroid gland. So the thyroid gland um, is, is kind of in your uh, upper, upper part of your chest cavity. Um, and the thyroid gland, its job is to control the metabolic rate in 
your body. So, so TSH has its effect by, by triggering uh, the thyroid gland to release another hormone called thyroxin. So, so again, TSH comes from the pituitary gland, thyroxin comes from the thyroid gland. And thyroxin, uh, once it goes out into the body, uh, increases the me metabolic rate of uh, a lot of different tissues in the body. So it sort of causes the, the body to, um, to start, uh, uh, cells in the body to um, become more metabolically active, um, breaking down more of their nutrients. Another uh, anterior pituitary hormone is called uh, ACTH, which, stand, which is an abbreviation for adrenocorticotropic hormone, um, and it works on the adrenal cortex. So the adrenal gland, we'll talk about in a minute. Um, the adrenal cortex is the outer layer of the adrenal gland, and the adrenal cortex releases a hormone called cortisol. So uh, cortisol is a hormone that does a lot of things. So it uh, triggers or mobilizes uh, energy stores in the body. Uh, it actually inhibits the immune system, um, and it has a whole bunch of effects. It's sometimes called the stress hormones. We'll talk about it more, uh, more in a second. Um, also worth pointing out that, you know, especially in the case of the, the uh, ACTH and TSH, these are hormones that cause other glands to release hormones. And that's the way a lot of these endocrine systems work. You have one gland that secretes a hormone that causes another gland to secrete another hormone and so on in, in sort of a, a cascading effect. Uh, another hormone from the anterior pituitary is called growth hormone, and it does exactly what it sounds like. Uh, actually, pretty much all cells have growth hormone receptors. And so when the uh, pituitary releases growth hormone, um, the uh, cells that it activates start producing more protein um, uh, and that in turn just leads to growth of the body. Um, so, so in fact, uh, there are various pituitary gland disorders that are associated with growth. So uh, a de deficit of growth hormone uh, causes reduced growth. So, so um, uh, certain kinds of dwarfism are caused by uh, lack of growth hormone in the body and can be treated by uh, giving recombinant uh, growth hormone. And uh, excess uh, growth hormone is also a condition. Um, so uh, people that are just excessively tall, meaning uh, getting like 9, 10 feet tall, uh, these are people usually with uh, pituitary gland disorder um, in which there there's too much growth hormone in their body. Um, and then finally, prolactin. Uh, again, kind of what it sounds like, uh, works on the mammary glands. So these are the glands that produce milk um, for offspring in mammals. And uh, uh, so prolactin, as the name implies, so uh, lactin as in to lactate, uh, prolactin promotes lactation. Um, that means it causes the mammary glands to grow and to secrete milk. So obviously these are released in, uh, in female mammals uh, after uh, they have offspring and while they're nursing. So just to go into one of these in a little more detail, uh, let's talk about the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis, or sometimes uh, usually just called the HPA axis. Um, so the HPA axis consists of the hypothalamic uh, neurosecretory cells that release the, the hormone that cause uh, ACTH to be released from the pituitary. So usually the thing that, that triggers the HPA axis is some sort of stress. So stress can be from uh, all the things that you you think of as causing stress. So pain, um, lack of food, lack of water, uh, fear um, uh, of say a threat like a predator um, or more long-term abstract uh, stress causing um, uh, stimuli like say the the knowledge of a future uh, exam and that uh, then activates through various mechanisms mostly through uh, things like the amygdala which we uh, we, we won't get to talking about in this chapter um, but that triggers uh, the hypothalamus to release a hormone called CRH so so CRH comes from the uh, from those neurosecretory uh, parvocellular neurons in the hypothalamus. Um, CRH stands for cort corticotropin-releasing hormone. 
because its job is to go into the pituitary and uh, uh, into the anterior pituitary and trigger the release of uh, ACTH. So ACTH or, or adrenal corticotropic hormone comes from the anterior pituitary, but again, it is released in response to CRH. So CRH is kind of the beginning of, of this HPA axis. Uh, and then ACTH goes into the blood and it eventually gets to the adrenal cortex. And then in the adrenal cortex, you have uh, cells that release the hormone called cortisol. So cortisol is called cortisol because it comes from the adrenal cortex. Um, but again, the adrenal cortex is just the outer layer of the adrenal gland. Um, so the adrenal gland has an interior portion called the medulla. So again, this is the adrenal medulla. This is the adrenal cortex. Um, and so cortisol comes from the cortex, and that's where the ACTH receptors are uh, also. By the way, the adrenal gland um, uh, is located right on top of the kidneys. In fact, that's what the word adrenal means. Um, renal means um, having to do with the kidneys, and the, the prefix ad there just means uh, next to or on top of or close to. So the adrenal glands are, are next to the kidneys. That's where the name comes from. So when we talk about the adrenal cortex, we're just talking about the outermost layer of the adrenal gland. So cortisol then comes from the adrenal cortex and it does a bunch of stuff. So it goes back to the brain um, and has effects in the brain. It also has effects uh, in various parts of the body. So for example, cortisol mobilizes energy reserves. So it sort of gets the body ready to deal with whatever the stressful situation is um, by by getting uh, the energy uh, in the body ready to be used. Also suppresses the immune system. Um, that's uh, most likely, again, just to get the body ready to deal with more of short-term problems, whereas uh, you know, the immune system takes, may take away resources from uh, uh, a, a danger that's more immediate. Uh, cortisol has various effects in the brain. It, it uh, kind of increases alertness and awareness uh, to some extent. Uh, also kind of has a sort of a positive feedback loop with the limbic system that we talked about, like the amygdala. Um, and one of the things it does also in the brain, um, in the hypothalamus, is to actually inhibit the release of CRH. So remember that CRH comes from the hypothalamus. Um, so when, the, when cortisol gets to the brain, it actually has the effect of reducing CRH release from the hypothalamus. So what that means is cortisol effectively inhibits itself. So it inhibits its own release. And this is actually common of, of a lot of these hormones. So they usually have some sort of negative feedback loop where the hormone itself will will inhibit whatever the the you know upstream uh, uh, network that caused the hormone to be released in the first place. So it's sort of a way of cortisol sending or the, the adrenal gland sending a signal back to the brain uh, that says, okay, I got, I got the message. I know that, that there's a, a stressful situation, so I'm releasing cortisol. Um, and uh, so that usually then shuts down this loop so that uh, once cortisol levels are elevated enough that the body can, can use it to respond to the, the stress, uh, there's no more cortisol needed. So that's a way for the, for the brain to shut down the system. Um, problem comes in, of course, when you have uh, long-term stress or stress that, that doesn't go away. So the brain is continuously under stress, so it's continuously releasing cortisol. And so uh, sort of chronic stress um, comes with its own set of problems because uh, once the uh, uh, the stress ha uh, stressful stimulus has gone away, the cortisol should go away. But if cortisol remains elevated, you have various problems. So for one thing, uh, cortisol, like I said, has various effects on the brain, some of which can lead to um, long-term uh, changes in the brain, sometimes even some sorts of brain damage. Um, obviously, long-term suppression of the immune system is not great. Uh, in fact, um, uh, cortisol levels uh, uh, being elevated for a long time is associated with increased risk of infection. So if you're under chronic stress, uh, you are more likely to get sick. Um, and, uh, and of course, um, that in fact is one of the uh, uh, ways that we interact with cortisol. So uh, cortisol uh, suppresses the immune system, um, which includes sort of localized inflammation. So if you have, um, you know, 
let's say a a, a rash or from um, a bug bite or something, um, the uh, your your skin's response to that is to release uh, a whole bunch of immune hormones uh, to kind of deal with that that problem. Uh, but that of course uh, causes the itching and redness and swelling um, that we associate with um, those kinds of, of toxins. Um, and so one medication you might take for that uh, or might use is, is a, um, a cortisol cream. So you apply cortisol cream to your skin and that inhibits the immune cells in your skin that are causing the inflammation and the itching. Um, and so that's why, uh, that's one way that cortisol is actually uh, uh, used as a, as a medication. Um, okay, and so next time we will uh, talk about the uh, autonomic nervous system.